Luke chapter 18, Hebrews uh, chapter number 4. Luke 18, let's read together verse number 1. Follow along as I read. The Bible says, And he, this is Christ, he spake a parable unto them to this end. Here was the purpose. Here was the objective. Here was the lesson that Christ is communicating through this parable or through this illustration. He spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. We won't read the parable just now, but Jesus goes on to speak in Luke 18 on the importance of consistency in prayer, the importance of praying without ceasing. He gives a story of a woman who was heard and received an answer. The Bible says because of her, because of her importunity, she kept asking and she eventually got what she was asking for. But I want to use that phrase in the first verse as a springboard for the message this morning. Men ought always to pray. And before we, before we really jump in, let me say this. Prayer is not the sum total of the Christian life. Prayer is an essential element of the Christian life. Prayer does not replace witnessing. Prayer does not replace Bible study. Prayer does not replace church attendance or separation from the world. Prayer is a necessary complement to all of those things. One man said we ought to work as if everything depends on us and pray as if everything depends on God. Right? Now, having said that, could we not all agree this morning that the flesh is inclined to lose sight of the importance of prayer? I believe that would be fair to say. I believe it would be fair to say this morning that the church suffers from a lack of prayerfulness. In general, the church today is lacking in this area. That seems to be an accurate observation. But let's, 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 let's hone in a little bit closer and let's put that question on a personal level, level this morning. Allow me to ask you as we study the Bible together, does your life suffer from a lack of of prayerfulness. Do we not all need this constant reminder from the Bible that men ought always to pray? The word ought means to be held in duty or moral obligation. We ought to pray. The word ought means to be necessary, to behoove. The word ought means to be fit or expedient in a moral view, to be owed or to be indebted to. What Jesus is saying in Luke 18, 1 is that prayer is vital. Prayer is essential. Prayer is crucial. It is necessary. It is indispensable. Men ought always to pray. And what we'd like to do with the message is show you the reasons why from the Bible, why it is that we should pray, we ought to pray, we must pray. And let's do that just now. Father, help us this morning as we study your word. God, give us good attention to the truth. Lead us and guide us and direct us. Lord, help me to say everything that needs to be said and nothing that should be left unsaid. Lord, I pray that you would receive honor and glory from the preaching and the hearing and the application of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter number four. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter number 4, and look with me at verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 14, and there the Bible says this, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, who is that? Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities. There's a double negative. It's, it, it, it's just a little bit more powerful than simply saying we have a great high priest touched with a finger of our infirmities. Same meaning we have not a great high priest that has not touched Jesus Christ. He came and experienced life as a man. So when we go to him, he knows where we're coming from. Amen. 
And what a blessing that is. The Bible says, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse number 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In verse number 16 of Hebrews 4, we are given an invitation. Let us therefore come. And we read over that, but we really need to stop and think about it a little bit more deeply this morning. What is this invitation? Who is sending this invitation? This morning, I could not give you a map and pinpoint for you the location of the third heaven where God lives. I know it's on the side of the north, the city of the great king, all that. I couldn't tell you how to get there. You could type it into your GPS and it would just be computing eternally because there are no directions for you to physically take a trip from here into the presence of God. Now, if you're saved one day, you'll make that trip, either by death or by the rapture, and I'm certain it will be a thrilling experience. But the Bible says this morning that at a moment's notice, anytime, anywhere, any place, I can bow my head or I can bow my knee or I can bow my heart and enter into the presence of of Almighty God. I can take a trip to the throne where God sits by means of prayer. He has offered that to His children. He has invited us to spend time in His presence. That really is an incredible thing. I don't think we appreciate the significance of what that is. We can attempt to illustrate it this morning. Let's just say that when you went home, not tomorrow, it's a mail holiday. When you went home on Tuesday and you go to the mailbox, inside the mailbox you have a letter with an invitation from the President of the United States for you to appear at the White House. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be political. I don't care what you think about this president, past president, future president, any of that. Just what a big deal it would be if you got an invitation to spend some time with the president of the United States. I don't expect to ever receive one of those letters. But if I did, I may be inclined to mention something about how humbled and honored I am. I, 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 you probably see a post of some kind on social media. They call it a humble brag. I'm so honored that I would have the privilege, right? Come on, that, that's something you would probably want people to know. That's something you would probably be excited about if for no other reason to give them a piece of your mind and tell them how he ought to run the country. But come on, it would be a big deal if you got invited to sit down with probably who, the most powerful man in the world, right? Yeah. Having received that invitation, though, it would not mean that you could get on a plane and fly up tomorrow and barge into the Oval Office. <clears throat> they would escort you out quickly. <laughs> and you would hope that is all that happens, right? But come on, that's a, that's a, that's a man. That is a man. But God said, anytime, if you are a believer, you have constant access to the throne of God. You don't have to show your ID. You don't have to go through security. You don't have to answer a bunch of questions or put in a password. Simply bow your head in prayer, and you're there in the presence of the God who sits on a throne of grace. I don't have to make an appointment. I got clearance the moment I trusted in the merits of Jesus Christ for the salvation of my soul, and I can come to God anytime I want. I have an open invitation. Now, let's not allow that to cheapen, cheapen the opportunity and the privilege that we have. We ought to let that amaze us. We ought to stand back and wonder that we could have an audience with God. Let us therefore come. The passage says, let us therefore come boldly. Boldly. 
Remember the upper room, John chapter 13, all the disciples, they're gathered with Christ at the Last Supper, and Jesus says this, tonight, one of you will betray me. And they all had the same question. They're all wondering who it is. Wouldn't you be thinking that? Wouldn't you want to know? They all wanted to know, but nobody wanted to ask Jesus. Finally, Peter, he, he, he nudges John, hey, John. John, ask him. No, you ask. No, you ask him. John was one of those guys like, what's the big deal? I'll ask him, Jesus, who's going to betray you? And Jesus answered. People, people have all kinds of natural dispositions. Did, did it work this way at your house? If there is more than one sibling, there is always one sibling that is nominated to ask the question. Myself, my older sisters, we were scared. So we'd tell Kimberly. <laughs> we want to go somewhere. We want to do something. We want to, hey, Kimberly, you go ask. Because she was the baby and she's spoiled rotten. You can tell. <laughs> she wasn't scared. She could ask whatever she wanted and most times she could get whatever she wanted. <laughs> and so we would take advantage of that, right? But back in the passage, it says, let us therefore come boldly. We don't have to be afraid. This is not saying we're just going to come and, and chill with God. We're just going to hang out with the big guy. This is not being comfortable or familiar. We come humbly, but we come boldly. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid to tell God what we need. We don't have to be afraid to make our requests known to Him. He has given us an invitation. He wants to hear us. He wants us to enter into His presence. We ought to be respectful, Amen. but bold. We ought to come humbly, but boldly. What an invitation that is open. Now, verse number 16 says, let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore, the passage is going to give us the reason, the explanation for why it is that we should receive this invitation and enter boldly into the presence of God. The, the therefore in verse number 16, it looks back to verses 14 and 15 where we're told that Jesus is our high priest. He is passing into the heaven. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. When we go to him, he's not going to just cast us aside. When we go to him, he really will understand what it is that we need. But it also looks forward into verse number 16, here is why we ought to pray. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here is why this morning men ought always to pray because we need God's grace. Because we need God's mercy. Because we stand in constant need of God's help. Amen. And we've been given an invitation to enter his presence in the place where we can access that mercy and that grace and that help. I don't know about you. I need God's help in my family. I need God's help in my home. I need God's help in my marriage. We need God's help in our church. I need God's help to live right and act right and do right. I need God's help in my health and, and physical circumstances and financial situations. Look, we are dependent upon the grace and the mercy and the help of God, certainly in time of temptation. I need one who can swiftly run to my aid. And I can go find that help, obtain that mercy, receive that grace, simply by entering into his presence. That's what we're told in Hebrews chapter 4. Prayer this morning, prayer is one of the best ways for us to remember and to acknowledge how dependent we are on God. Prayer is one of the best ways for us to remember and to acknowledge how much we're dependent on God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, we are, we are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency 
is of God. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Matthew 6, 8, Jesus said, For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Here's the purpose of taking our needs to God in prayer. It's not to inform him. He knows how dependent we are on his help. It's not, to, it's not to make him aware of our need. It's certainly not to advise him on what he should do for us or in our lives. He is fully aware of exactly what we need. But taking our need to the Lord, it helps us remember that we need his help. And it is the means whereby he has ordained that we can obtain that mercy and grace we so desperately need. And then when we do that and God answers and he comes through and he supplies, we're that much more likely to give him the credit, to give him the thanks, to give him the glory that he deserves. All right, so why should we pray? Because we need God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 19. Here's why we ought to pray. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. The Bible says, having therefore, brethren, boldness, that matches verse we just read. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holiness, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here's what Jesus did when he made an ultimate payment and sacrifice that would forever cleanse the sin of anyone who trusted him. He opened up that way of access. The Bible says in the Old Testament in the temple, there was the holiest place, the holy of holies. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. It's where the mercy seat sat on the Ark of Covenant. It was where God's presence dwelt among his people. And from the, from the holy place into the holy of holies, in between, there was this giant veil. And one time, every year, one man, the high priest of the nation, could actually enter into that holiest place where the presence of God was. And he had to make an offering for himself and then an offering for the people. He would sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says when Jesus Christ became the image of the shadow, when he fulfilled the types and the pictures, when he made one sacrifice for sins forever. You know what happened to that veil? The Bible says the moment he bowed his head in death, that veil was rent from the top to the bottom. And our access in the presence of God was secured. No longer is it one man once a year on behalf of the nation. The Bible says, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I don't go, have to go through a man to get to God. I go through Jesus Christ to get to God. And he has opened the way for me. So by the blood of Jesus, I have boldness to go. And the Bible says, when I go is for the purpose, verse number 22, of drawing near. We ought to pray because we need God's help. We ought to pray because it's what draws us close to God. And heaven knows we could all stand to be a little closer to the Lord. Now, come on, have you not experienced this in your Christian life? Have you not had troubles and trials and circumstances and situations and difficulties that drove you to the prayer closet? And in those times when your life was in turmoil, in those times when the situations around you were just completely out of your control, in the times of life that were the most difficult, those were the times that you were closest to God. Because that was the time that you were driven to your knees in prayer. Amen. And that's why we, we have to pray. We must pray. We ought to pray. Because we need God's help. Amen. And because it draws us close to Him. Now that's all from our perspective. But what I want to give you quickly is the reasons from God's perspective. Come to 1 Samuel chapter number 12. 1 Samuel chapter number 12. This in the Old Testament. We've seen from Hebrews that... Number one, God invites us to pray. 
God invites us to pray. But it goes further than that. In the Bible, over and over again, God commands us to pray. What does the word ought mean? It, it, it means we're obligated. We have a duty, right? This is a matter of commandment. This is a matter of obedience. While you're turning to 1 Samuel 12, let me read you a list of verses. These, these will all fall under other headings as well, but they all show that we're commanded to pray. Luke 18, 1, we read it. Men ought always to pray. Psalm 62, 8. Pour out your heart before him. That's a commandment. God wants us. He instructs us to do this. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, he said, call unto me. That's, that's what they call in grammar class an imperative sentence. Somebody is being told what to do. The teller is us. The toter, I'm sorry, the teller is God. The toter is us. God is telling us what to do, and he's telling us, pray. Call to me. Matthew 6, 9, after this manner, therefore, Pray ye, Jesus said. He said, Matthew 7, 7, Ask, ye shall receive. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. He said, Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not temptation. Romans 12, 12, Continue instant in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, Part of the armor of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Philippians 4, 6, We are commanded, let our requests be made known to God. Colossians 4, 2, We are told, continue in prayer. And watching the same with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Couldn't say it any more simply. Pray. Without ceasing. 1 Peter 4, 7, watch unto prayer. Over and over again in the Bible, God makes it very clear that we are under duty and obligation and commandment and instruction to commune with Him, to speak with Him, to pray to Him. Look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 23. The Bible says, Moreover, as for me, Samuel addressing the nation, says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I'll teach you the good and right way, only fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things that uh, he hath done for you. Did you see that? 1 Samuel 12, 23 identifies prayerlessness as sin. Not only do we cut ourselves off from the blessings and the benefits of spending time with God in prayer, but the Bible says we're in violation of His commandment, and that is sin. To him that knoweth to do good, James 4, 17, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We ought to think of sin as the things that God tells us not to do, but we go ahead and do them. Sin is also the things that God tells us we ought to do, but then we don't. And prayer is one of those things, but look at, look at how Samuel underscores the importance of this. He says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He's saying, can you imagine how horrible a crime it would be if I did not pray for you? We don't often put that on the list of horrible ways that we can sin. A horrible sin would be lying about somebody. A horrible sin in our mind would be cheating somebody, stealing for somebody, taking somebody's wife. And those are horrible sins. But Samuel said, God forbid. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord. Can you imagine? He is, he is expressing this shock and amazement, maybe even outrage at the thought of a failure to intercede on someone's behalf. He says, it's sin. We are commanded to pray. Question, Christian, this morning, is this a sin you need to confess? God forbid that I should sin against the Lord. Have you sinned in this way? Men ought always to pray because God invites us, because God commands us, because God hears us. Look at Psalm 115. Psalm 115, go there with me in your Bible. Psalm 115. We ought to pray because God invites us. We ought to pray because God commands us. We ought to pray because God hears us. Psalm 115, verse number 1, the Bible says, Not unto us, O Lord, Psalm 115, 1, Not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Look at this. They have mouths, but they speak not. You ever notice that about an idol? 
They have ears, but they hear not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. I've been to Cambodia. I've visited the Wat. I've visited the temple. I have seen the Buddhists burning their incense and chanting their prayers. I have watched the monks travel from house to house to collect the alms and, and, and pray with those devoted adherents to their religion. But as they bow before the statues, as they chant towards the idols, they're not being heard. That prayer is going into the air, but never is it received into the ear of someone who's actually listening. Talk to Brother Steve Holt about being woken up at 5 o'clock in the morning by the morning call to prayer. And all these faithful followers of the Prophet Muhammad five times a day get down on their rugs and bow down and face Mecca and, and call out to a God who doesn't exist. We have the true and living God seated on a throne of mercy and a throne of grace. But how often does he hear from us? When we pray, he does hear. Unlike the false gods of the heathen all around the world who chant and pray and vainly repeat prayers. Just speaking it out into the air. But that's as far as it ever gets. Look at Psalm 116, verse 1. Across the page, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Verse number 2, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Most of us, maybe this, maybe this is just a personal testimony, most of us are not very good listeners. Maybe that's why I need God's help in my marriage. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. <laughs> Most of us are not really good listeners. We, we're more interested in what we're saying or what we're about to say or how we're going to respond and what the person is saying. But God is an active listener. The Bible says he, he inclines his ear toward our prayers. When you enter the presence of God, you have his undivided Attention. He listens. He hears. He is taking it in. Thankfully, he's ignoring much of it. <laughs> Thankfully, the Holy Spirit is interpreting and making requests according to the will of God, but, but God inclines his ear to our prayers. And look what the verse says. Therefore... For that reason, with this knowledge, I will call upon him as long as I live. Brothers and sisters, that's a great reason why we ought to pray. Because when we pray, God hears us. Because when we pray, God listens to us. Psalm 55, 17, evening and morning at noon will I pray and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. Psalm 10, 17 says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart, thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Psalm 34, 6, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. If you're saved this morning, aren't you glad that when you called on the name of the Lord, he heard you? Amen. Aren't you glad when you called out for mercy and grace and salvation and eternal life? He wasn't like Baal on the day that Elijah's challenging the prophets of Baal. You remember that? They're, they're each supposed to call on their gods and see which one answers with fire from heaven. And all morning long, these men, they jump on the altar, they cut themselves, they dance, they chant, they, they perform all these rituals. And Elijah's just sitting back and saying, maybe your God's on a trip. Maybe your God's taking a nap. Apparently, he's not hearing you right now. But God hears us. And that's why we ought to pray. Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. Just a couple more quickly. Proverbs 15. Look at Proverbs 15. Here's why we ought to pray. Because God invites us. Because God commands us. Because God hears us. Because God delights 
in our prayers. Because God delights in our prayers. Look at Proverbs 15, uh, Proverbs 15 verse number 8. The Bible says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. You cannot con God into blessing you. <laughs> okay? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The prayer of the upright is his delight. The Bible says we're created for his pleasure, Revelation chapter 4, 11. You know, prayer is one of the ways that you can fulfill your created purpose because God delights in hearing our prayers. Think of this in terms of a parent-child relationship, not so much a parent-teen relationship, maybe a parent-toddler relationship. We, we use the words, I love you, a lot in our house. And we try not to just use the words. We try to actually back it up and demonstrate that and express that in different ways. But we tell our children, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, one of the greatest feelings in the world is the first time that little two or three-year-old that can barely talk, when they're the one that initiates it. When they come up to you and they say, before you even say anything, Mommy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. Come on, does it get any better than that? You know God's our Father? Do you know we're His children? Do you know we're probably not toddlers, we're probably infants? But you know it blesses His heart when His children just want to sit up in His lap and speak to Him and commune with Him and spend time with him and talk to him. It's just a blessing when you've got their attention. God says he delights in the prayer of the upright. Psalm 141, 2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Cross-reference from Revelation chapter 8 says that our prayers are offered up before God as incense. Now, I know that's old and archaic. Let me give you the modern rendering. It's like a Yankee candle. Just this time of year, people want to fill their homes with this, this odor that's pleasant and evokes memories and nostalgia. It's just something that, that, something that sweetens the atmosphere. That's what our prayer is like to God. It's like sweet. And, come on, don't you know there's not much in this world that God can take delight in? But the prayer of his children, it's something that's sweet to the God who sits on that throne of grace. Look at one more. Come back to Luke chapter 18 and get James 5. Luke 18 and James 5. Why must we pray? Why should we pray? Because God invites us, because God commands us, because God hears us, because God delights in our prayers. And finally, last but not least, God answers God answers prayer. Let's read the parable that Jesus spake in Luke chapter number 18. The Bible says in verse number 1, He spake a parable unto them this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a certain judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, there's, there are a lot of ins and outs to the parable. There are a lot of different directions we can take the, cheat, the teaching. But the, the, the point of the passage is this. The woman who came and asked, she got what she asked for. Her continued pleading was effective. It brought about the desired result. That's undeniable from the passage. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 16. James 5, 16, the Bible says, Confess your faults one to another, not your sins, please. <laughs> please, we don't have a confessional booth. Amen. You take care of that in the prayer closet. 
we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You know who that is? That's God. <laughs> okay? But faults, a shortcoming, a, a character defect. We confess our faults to one another, and the Bible says, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, look what the Bible says, availeth much. Prayer works. God answers. Prayer changes people and situations. Now, of course, there are conditions. We can study that from the Bible. Of course, there are hindrances to gaining answers to prayer. We can study that from the Bible. I don't have time this morning. Of course, oftentimes we find out that the answer is no. We can see that from the Bible. I'm not saying this morning that prayer is just a blank check that God signed and you can name and claim whatever you want and He's bound by an oath to give it to you because you said it and you asked for it. That's not how prayer works. I don't pretend to really understand exactly how it does work because mankind is given free will. Right? Everybody does have to make their own choices. And how that works together with God influencing people and working in hearts and the king's heart being handled. I don't know that I can clearly understand or explain all of that this morning. But the undeniable truth of scripture is that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The, the undeniable truth of scripture this morning is that prayer, it changes us. And yes, that's a blessing, but prayer changes things. It does. We ought to pray because it's effective. We ought to pray because God not only hears he answers, what did he say in James 4? You have not, because you ask not. In a case, you just ask, you could have it. The problem is most people ask amiss that they make a consumment upon their lust. The, the problem is our mind immediately goes, oh, a million bucks. <laughs> but no, 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 that's not what we really need. You see, Matthew 6, God knows what we need. <laughs> And if we'll ask him in accord with his will and what we need, then, then, then God will grant and God will bless. See, that promise we have now, because we ask now, that promise that the effectual for prayer of a righteous man availeth much, that applies to what we, we're in Hebrews 4, God's help, God's grace, God's mercy, his blessing, his favor, his provision. Souls saved, lives changed. Marriages put back together, those things oftentimes can be the result or the outcome or at least be influenced by the prayers of God's people. Now my prayer can't change that person, they've got to make a decision, but my prayer, the Bible says, can definitely influence or turn the heart of God or put his attention on a person or, or some circumstance. Prayer changes things. We can't force anyone, and God won't force anyone. But we can't deny that prayer has an influence and has an effect. Jeremiah 29 says, Then shall ye call upon me, ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. Him that knocketh, it shall be opened. How many blessings did God want to give us, but he didn't give us, and he couldn't give us, because we failed to ask. Because we didn't pray. Because we did not take advantage of the means whereby he ordained that we might obtain his grace. Let us therefore come boldly on the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. And find grace to help in our time of need. We ought to pray because we're dependent on God and because it draws us close to God, but we ought to pray because God invites us, because God commands us, because God hears us, because God delights in hearing, because God answers our prayers. It is the means whereby He has chosen to address the needs in our hearts and in our lives. Brethren, let's not sin against the Lord in ceasing 
to pray. You know, you know what's interesting in the Bible? Most of the passages on prayer, it's not about us. It's not about God give me, it's, it's about God bless them. It's prayer for others. It's a demonstration of a Christ-like spirit and attitude and approach to life. Now, now let me close with this. Here's, here's one of the greatest promises in the Word of God, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Many prayers I pray, I don't know if it's the will of God to, or not. I don't know if the answer will be yes or no. Here's one prayer that when I prayed it, when you prayed it, when anyone prays it, I know the answer will be yes. You would call out to God this morning, a guilty sinner, with no hope of eternal life outside what Jesus Christ did for you. If you would go to God and say, I have sinned, I deserve your judgment, but I believe Jesus died for me. I believe Jesus rose again. I am trusting him right now to take away my sins. If you would call on the name of the Lord, the answer is always yes. John 6, 37, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I'm so thankful this morning I prayed and had that prayer answered. And there are so many other prayers in my life where God has come through with just exactly the grace that I needed, that my brothers and sisters in Christ needed, and let's, let's just be reminded consistently that men ought always to pray. Amen. Father, thank you for your word this morning, the instruction it gives us. Lord, sure do thank you for allowing us to be in church together. Thank you for a congregation full of people who want to hear what the Bible says. Lord, help us to be hearers, then help us to be doers. In Jesus' name, amen.